Thank you. Um, it's fantastic to see you all here and to be at, here at such an important moment for uh, design uh, in the Irish government and in Ireland uh, across the board. And, and I think that last address from the minister resonated probably with a lot of people in the room that there is no such thing as no design. Um, I'm definitely nicking that one after today. But um, hi, everyone. It's really good to be here. Um, so I, I run an organisation called uh, the School of Good Services. And uh, as I explained last night uh, over dinner, it is a bit of a sheep dip process <laughs> to help people understand what good design looks like, how it works in their organisation. Uh, we provide coaching, support, training and mentorship for all sorts of different organisations on that journey. Uh, and the principles in that work are really founded in a book that I wrote a couple of years ago called Good Services. And in that book, there are 15 principles of what makes a good service. So those are free uh, and available online. Do go and check them out. Um, but today, I'm not really going to be talking very much about that. I'm going to be talking about my experience as design director and director of service standards for UK central government, which I did for seven years. Um, and the output of all of that work was this. This is Gov.uk, which you might be familiar with, is the central platform for all public services um, in the UK. And my time in government involved growing a team of over 2,000 designers, user researchers and content designers across central government. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about how we got there, <laughs> what's involved in that. Um, there was a huge amount of support that was uh, provided for those designers. It wasn't just the actual designers themselves. There was also uh, products, services that enabled people to actually produce better public services. Uh, things like the service standard, which again, many of you will be familiar with. Um, it's a 20 point standard uh, that allows people to understand what makes a good service and how to actually provide one. So today I'm gonna to be talking about what services actually are, because I think that's a really important point to start with. Uh, we've all got very different understandings of what we mean by services, so I'll talk about that. Um, I'll talk about why we need design on services, why design is so intrinsic to the delivery of good services, and then three lessons for Ireland that certainly I wish I had known when I started my work um, in the UK public service. So I want to start by just asking the question, how, how did we get here? How, how did the UK government end up in a situation where I was there recruiting this vast number of designers, producing products and services and support and tools for them? Because um, I have never taken it for granted that that was something that needed a huge amount of investment, huge amount of commitment to. And it's fantastic to see that that's happening here in Ireland as well. Um, but the reason for this is essentially government is the oldest and largest service provider in the UK. Um, and so, of course, service design needs to be intrinsic to that process. What we do is we provide services. Um, and in the UK government context, that is a lot of services. There's about 10,000 of them. We don't actually know how many services there are because no one's actually managed to count them successfully, but we do know there's about 10,000. Uh, 25 different departments and um, almost 500,000 people. So a vast collection um, of people who are all working on different services. Uh, and as I said, the home of all of those services is this website, uh, gov.uk. Uh, it contains everything from births, deaths, marriages, um, beehives, <laughs> uh, regulation for fishing, you name it, it will be on gov.uk. Um, there's over five, uh, sorry, 500,000 pages and it has about 1.7 million uh, visits per week. So it is a extremely well used, high traffic uh, part of the UK government. And in fact, actually a couple of years ago was de designated a piece of critical national infrastructure in the same way that we see our power stations and our docks as critical national infrastructure. So if Gov.uk goes down, then it's as big a problem as a power station. But the things that sit behind that shiny veneer of Gov.uk are um, less perhaps well designed. And this is a small selection of some of the services that live on Gov.uk. 
Um, and you can see from this glorious list that they are not necessarily things that we will all really understand. Um, and if we wanted to, for example, learn to drive or buy a car or, uh, you know, kind of become to the UK and stay, for example, it would be very difficult to understand which of these services you were actually supposed to use. And my favourite of all of them is a service called ARAMS, which is actually the sheep and cattle tracing service. Um, so never let it be said that a civil servant doesn't love a good pun. But if you look at this list of services, you can see, aside from the phonetic acronyms, you've got a list of things that are very difficult for people to tell what they actually are. So if you wanted to learn to drive, which of these services you would use? I have no idea. If you wanted to move to the UK, you would be similarly stumped. Um, start a business, good luck. <laughs> There's probably about 50 services that you might be able to use. And because of this, because of this confusion about what those services are on Gov.uk, it means that people interact with Gov.uk in a very sort of un unnecessary way, I think, in a way that actually uh, shouldn't be the way that people are interacting with public services. So this is what's called the performance platform. It shows the top uh, most popular performing services, content, various other things on Gov.uk. And you can see here at number eight um, is contact the DVLA, which is basically the organization that provides driving licenses and makes sure that vehicles are safe. So essentially, people are Googling a phone number and looking for that phone number on Gov.uk, which sort of means that the eighth most popular service on Gov.uk is a phone number, which is not the bright, shiny digital future that anyone had in mind when producing this incredibly important platform for public services. Um, we want to make it easier for people who do need to phone government to obviously be able to phone, but that is a very, very small number of people. And the vast majority of people who are searching for that phone number are doing so because they cannot find what they're looking for elsewhere because those services are really uh, badly designed. And the problem that we have in the UK public sector, which is very similar to uh, many other governments, is that our services were not designed for the internet. They were designed much more for a world that looked like this, where you walked into your post office, which was a nationalized service, um, or your frontline government office, and you said to the person behind the desk, I'm trying to start a business, what do I need to do? And that person would probably go behind the desk and rifle through all of their forms, find the right form for you, help you to fill it in, and probably help you to post it as well if it was a post office. But this is not how services work on the internet. And services today start with Google. Google is the homepage to your service. Regardless of whether or not it is a digital service or not, Google is where people will start. And unless they can Google your service and find their way to it, essentially what you're going to end up with is a big pile of Google fails. And that's what we've got on Gov.uk, a massive pile of things that people cannot find because they don't know what they're already looking for. They don't know what the ARAM service is and they don't know how to sawn a vehicle because they've never experienced it before. And this problem is not just affecting our users. It's not just stopping our users from interacting with public services and knowing that those things exist. It's also having a massive effect on the civil service as well and on the cost of the public sector. So in government, we know that the UK government spends about 80% of its budgets on services, which is not surprising because it's, like I said, the oldest and largest service provider in the UK. So services is its main thing. What is more surprising, though, is that up to 60% of that cost is spent on calls and casework. So basically, people phoning up government saying, hey, how do I do this thing? Or you've had my passport for six months. What the hell is going on? Um, or filling in a form incorrectly, uh, because that form has been badly designed. That form then goes to a caseworker. And then we have to spend money basically kind of trying to figure out what that person was doing. So up to 60% of the cost of our services is basically spent with people not being able to engage with them, not being able to use them. And if you're wondering at this stage just what proportion of phone calls are actually people um, who would otherwise not, not be making a phone call, a lot of them. Uh, so 53% of the calls that come into central government departments are people who have already tried to use something on Gov.uk have failed to do so because they couldn't find it or it wasn't what they were looking for, it wasn't clear, and so they then needed to make a phone call. So that's a failure of Gov.uk, that 53% of those calls. 
And when we think about the fact that a third of UK GDP is spent on public services, that is a vast amount of money that's being wasted on bad service design. And actually, bad service design is one of the biggest unnecessary costs to UK taxpayers right now. Um, and this is something that in my seven years as a civil servant, I spent a huge amount of my time talking to various different ministers, officials, different government organizations about. Um, and it never made the headlines. And you won't be surprised by that because ultimately this is the type of money that is spent in the background. It's spread thinly across the cost of all of our call centers and all of our processing and such that we don't actually even realize that this cost is the cost of bad service design. So it's never gonna hit the Daily Mail or the newspapers in the same way that government spending on bad IT will you know, hit the Daily Mail. But bad service design is hidden in plain sight. Um, it's hidden in small problems with our services that with you know, a kind of often a very minimal amount of effort, we could massively improve. And so when we talk about service design in government, I think it's often that we, we forget about this kind of incremental movement and this slow change of services over time. But it's really important that we do because that's where the problems are and that's where the cost is for government. So to give you an example, this is a service um, that helps people to declare medical problems um, if they are a driver. So um, in the UK, um, you have to declare a medical condition that um, affects your ability to drive. Uh, it means that you, know, you don't get in trouble with the law if you're in an accident, but it also means we have safe drivers on the road. But when this service first came out on Gov.uk, uh, and it's, a, again, a, a DVLA service, um, Drivers and Vehicles Licensing Agency, um, the only information that was about this service that described who should be using it and why they should be using it was this information here in the red box. And it basically says, you must tell the DVLA if you have a driving license and you develop a notifiable medical condition or disability, or a condition or disability has got worse since you got your license. So basically, we have no idea what notifiable means. We don't know if that means a stiff neck since 1985 uh, or glaucoma. Um, it could be anything and anywhere in between. And in fact, actually, the result of this um, service being designed in the way that it did uh, was a 40%, um, uh, basically, percentage of declarations to this service being completely unnecessary. So 40% of the people who were telling DVLA about their medical condition actually didn't need to tell the DVLA about their condition at all. And if you're curious about the top three conditions, I don't know if you can guess, but these were them. Um, <laughs> so, uh, ingrown toenails. <laughs> if you've ever had one, very painful, but not gonna affect your ability to drive. Stiff necks, hemorrhoids. Again, my sympathies to anyone who's suffering from this. Um, they are painful and uncomfortable, but they are not the things that we really care about. The things that we really care about are the medical conditions that will genuinely affect your ability to drive. So this team, realizing that this was happening, seeing this in flood of people who actually were declaring problems that they didn't need to, realized that all they could do was basically just add a very, very simple piece of text at the bottom of the service that clarified what they meant by notifiable conditions, and then really clearly listed some of the types of conditions that we mean. And those are the types of conditions that, you know, if you read that and you've, you've got an ingrown toenail, you're not going to go, right, OK, <laughs> declare my toenail problem. Um, and really importantly, including why people should declare it. So a notifiable condition is anything that affects your ability to be able to drive safely. And just by doing this, this tiny bit of content that took them all of about five minutes to put on Gov.uk, no technology changes, um, it resulted in a 12% reduction in unnecessary declarations, which obviously huge amount of cost reduction for government, so you know, win for government, but also a massive win for users because the people who really do need to use this service are very often professional drivers who, because of their lifestyle, are developing conditions that affect their ability to drive and also older drivers. And both of those groups absolutely rely on their ability to be able to drive for their livelihoods. So the 12% reduction for government involves a huge amount of increase in speed, obviously, for those users getting an answer on whether or not they can drive again. So uh, it's really heartening that the minister mentioned this before, but I, I, I'll reiterate the message. Good services are designed. This stuff does not happen by accident, and it doesn't happen when there are not designers working on those services. 
And when we talk about design, you didn't think you were gonna see Lawrence Will and Bowen today, did you? <laughs> when we talk about design, I think sometimes there's this massive misunderstanding, misinterpretation of what that actually means. And in, I can see it in people's faces when I tell them I'm a designer and they, they, they picture this. They picture you know, someone sort of basically adding more colors, more you know, stuff everywhere and making things look nicer, basically. Although it's debatable whether or not Lawrence Swellenbaren does actually make things look nicer. But what we mean by government design, what we mean by design in the public sector is this type of design. And there is a huge history of design, huge heritage actually of design in the public sector. Um, this is one of London's sewers uh, designed by Isingbard Kingdom Brunel, uh, designed to be three times the size that it needed to be to basically allow for the expansion of the city. Uh, and Gov.uk was, was uh, built in the same way. We designed it to essentially be a platform that could incorporate vastly more services, vastly more traffic than it needed to. So this is the type of design that we're talking about. Um, or Margaret Calvert uh, and her work um, with Jock Kinnear to design um, new transport, uh, the font that's actually used on Gov.uk that's based off of this font, so the motorway sign font. And the reason why that font was used on Gov.uk was because it was basically tested like this. So it was uh, strapped to the top of a very old car and driven towards a stand of people uh, who all had various different uh, levels of vision uh, in various different weather conditions to make sure that it was a really legible font. And it turns out if someone's driving at 60 miles an hour down a motorway with you know, kind of blinding sun, actually that's a similar level of kind of reading ability and of stress that someone's encountering if they're reading about visas and immigration on their phone on the top of a bus. So that's why uh, Gov.uk uses new transport as a font. But there would be no public services without design. Um, you know, and I think those examples just show the heritage and the history of this. This is not, not something that is new uh, and something that's happened in the last five or 10 years. This has been going on for hundreds of years in the context of public services. But what we mean by design in government, and specifically in the UK government, what we mean by design is basically these four professions. So content design, interaction design, graphic design, and service design. And I want to just walk you through um, an example of Gov.uk uh, and what it looks like when you remove those things, <laughs> just to give you a picture. So firstly, content design. Um, content design is essentially the ability to be able to take the ideas included in a service and explain them in words. So content designers are writers, uh, they're experts in communication. If you take out content designers, the words go away or they get incredibly complicated uh, to understand. So content designers are absolutely fundamental to all central government services. We've also got interaction designers though. Interaction designers design the way that people interact with government services. So things like search, things like all the buttons and the styling, making sure that actually they are in the right place and they make sense to people and they can use them. They feel like a government service. Uh, graphic design. <laughs> I know, uh, you know there was a, a mention of graphic design this morning. Graphic design is absolutely vital to the UK public sector. We wouldn't have new transport font. We wouldn't have the colors that are trusted. We wouldn't have the brand of Gov.uk without graphic design. Graphic design is absolutely intrinsic to what we do and Gov.uk would look like this without them. So thank you to the graphic designers. Um, but also service design. Now service design is basically the, uh, the part of design that works with policy, with operations to define how our services work. If we didn't have service designers in government, we just quite simply would have services that did not work. So service design is absolutely vital. But service design can only happen when we have service literacy, when we have an ability to understand what services are, to be able to see them as real things that can and should be designed, to understand what makes a good service, and to be able to commit to designing those services. So I'm gonna talk very quickly about three lessons for Ireland that I wish I had known uh, that all seven, seven, eight, nine years ago when I started doing this in the UK public sector. The first one is to do the hard work to make services visible. Um, by far, the hardest part of all of this journey will be helping people in your organizations to understand that services exist as a real thing and understand what they actually are. Uh, because ultimately, in order to design anything, chairs, carpets, services, you actually have to believe that they exist. And the problem we have is that we've got a very different understanding of services in government to the understanding that our users have. 
So we see services as these collection of kind of diffracted moments, individual interactions with a user. Our user, of course, though, see the, sees that thing as a process that they're going through to be able to reach an end goal. So the first task we have is to make those services visible. And ultimately, without doing that, we're going to end up with a relay race of people involved in that journey, not panning over the baton successfully to each other. We'll end up with services that break. So every decision that we make affects our service in some way. If we look at this glorious example of a beautiful public sector service, which I won't name and shame whose it is, um, you can see the types of decisions that add up to those bad decisions. Um, we've got policy decisions, we've got KPIs, we've got teams that are passing those things down to their organizations and the culture that we have. And all of those things mean that they add up to a bad service. And without an awareness of the effect of all of those different decisions, on the end experience that a user will have, none of those things will add up to a good service. So it's vital that everyone in our organization understands what services are, what makes a good one, and is committed to actually delivering good services. But that requires us to actually know what our services are in the first place, which, as I said, in UK government, we actually don't know. We've still got a long way to go to understand them. But some work uh, is being done to, to understand those things in more detail. And this is a brilliant project by the Home Office, which is worth checking out. It's publicly um, available on GitHub and on um, various other places. This is a list that they've created of their services to allow everyone in the organization to understand which bit of which service they're part of. But this work is complicated. This work involves multiple different organizations coming together to deliver those services. Because of course, something like coming to the UK and staying involves about 15 different departments. So that's a vast number of people that need to be involved. So actually putting the commitment into helping people to work across organizational boundaries is a really big part of it. And it was a big part of my work at GDS. Which leads me on to the next point, uh, that people make services. Um, Gov.uk would not exist without the people who design and deliver that service. And as I said before, we've got a lot of services and a lot of different people who are delivering those things. And in fact, if you were to add up all of the civil service, it would add up to about the size of kind of uh, Greater Manchester. So that's a, a vast diversity of people who are all having to basically believe that services exist. And no amount of principles, standards, or tools will unite this group. It's absolutely fantastic to see the principles being launched today, and they are a fundamental part of where we started uh, at GDS. But principles can only get you so far without investing in the communities and the people that need to actually put those principles into action, um, and the communities of practice that drive the UK uh, public service are essentially communities that have been recruited and brought in and nurtured in government for that reason. And for the reason that essentially telling people what to do is a really ineffective way of getting service design to happen properly. I think we all know that probably intrinsically. Uh, and really what we need to do is enable them to make better decisions. Um, so that involves training. Um, you know, we were providing training every single week consistent job descriptions, monthly meetups, regular comms, trips, leadership coaching, and an almost infinite list of other things that we did to support those communities. But design teams are only really, um, you know, kind of this more than some of the, some of their parts. They are more than just the individuals that we bring into those groups. We have to facilitate those people with the tools and the systems to be able to actually produce consistent services. So this is um, the Gov.uk design system. Um, this is a, a product that allows people to take consistent patterns for UK public services, create those patterns, and then share them back to the community. But this work doesn't come for free. Um, it absolutely requires investment in the communities. I had a team of 20 people who just looked after the community, just did the work to get job descriptions and team meetups and conferences to happen. So it's a vast amount of activity that needs to happen in this. And this last point I want to finish on, because um, I know we're running out of time, is really enabling people to do good work. Um, when, when we talk about kind of enabling service design to happen, often we talk about either making it hard to do the wrong thing or making it easy to do the right thing. And in reality, actually, you need to do both. It's not just about standards and controls and stopping bad services from happening. It's also about encouraging good services to happen at the same time. So uh, some of the tools that we had at our disposal to be able to do this uh, was obviously the service standard. Any public service that goes on to Gov.uk needs to conform to this uh, 
uh, pointed standard. And then right at the top there is understanding users and their needs. So that no service can go on Gov.uk without user research and without designers working in that team. We also had a set of design principles which went through various iterations of various different pro posters and, and you know, ways of communicating those principles. Uh, the fact that they were so short and so memorable um, made them work. They, they started to become the kind of almost mantra that people embodied. But they were co-created um, you know, in the way that we produced them, the way that we shared them with that design community across government. They weren't just the GDS design principles, they were everyone's design principles. We also have a thing called the service manual, which um, if you haven't come across it before, do check it out. It is a, a, essentially a manual on how to produce services, everything from uh, agile delivery to design, technology standards, and everything you would possibly ever need to know about designing and delivering digital services. We also produced a number of standardized products to enable services to happen more quickly. So things like Gov.uk Pay or Gov.uk Notify that allows payments and text messages to be sent. Uh, centrally uh, without people having to rebuild those platforms and spend loads of time designing those services they don't need to. Uh, equally, like I said before, things like the design system contributed to by the, that collection of 2,000 designers across government. This wasn't just a central activity of GDS. Uh, it was the product of the community across government. So um, I'll finish there, and I think we've probably got a little bit of time for some questions. Um, this is really the beginning of a conversation. I'm so excited to kind of uh, be here for the start of that um, here in uh, Irish government. But thank you very much. Thank you.